Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event, part of the Cambridge Festival. My name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus College, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to Jesus for this event, which is also joined with the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, and I'll say a bit more about them in a moment. Some of you will know Jesus extremely well. I mean the college, not the deity. For some of you, this may be your first time here. I'm afraid the jokes get worse from here on in. Um, for those of you who are, who are new, you are incredibly welcome, whether you're here in person uh, or online, wherever in the world you may be. Jesus has an amazing history. This was originally set up in 1144 when a small group of itinerant nuns were given a little plot of land by Nigel, Bishop of Ely. Um, we since grew. King Malcolm of Scotland gave us land. You may notice this isn't Scotland, but that's another story. And in 1496, the then Bishop of Ely came to see how things were going. He said there were two nuns left. One of them was rather elderly, and the other was of ill fame. You can interpret that how you like. So he kicked them out and turned it into an all-male college, something we've since, I'm pleased to say, corrected. And we've had amazing people throughout that entire time, from 1144 to now, who've thought about many of the biggest issues of our time. Um, people like Thomas Malthus who was here, who thought about population and how we would tackle with that, the limits uh, of growth. We've had people like Lisa Jardine. Uh, more recently, we've had people like Clean Bandit. For those of you who know Rockabye? I'm, yes, I'm seeing a few nods at least. Good. And so we spent a long time thinking about these issues, and the Intellectual Forum was set up in 2016 to help to foster that. We've run many events on many, many different subjects. Do have a look online for the past ones. But a recurrent theme has been technology. The good, the bad, the ugly, what we can do, what we should do. So we've had some wonderful speakers. Uh, we've had uh, Twitter's global head of public policy speaking just after Elon Musk had said he was going to buy it. We've had the um, vice president, I think he is, of Facebook's oversight board to talk about what they're doing to look after Facebook. We've also had Siva Vaidyanathan to talk about how Facebook is fundamentally evil. You can take your views on all of these. Just last week... We ran a global summit on responsible AI in this, in this room here, the Frankopan Hall, which I'm told, I haven't been able to verify, is the largest group of responsible AI people in one room. Um, I don't know how anyone else would verify that, but I'm told it's true. And so this fits in very well with that theme. What do we do about technology? How do we get the best out of it and limit the harms? Public policy is something that we're interested in, but we're delighted to work with the Bennett Institute for Public Policy, who are even more interested uh, in public policy. And we'll hear shortly from Diane, who runs it. There are some brochures that you should have been given which talks about what the Bennett Institute does. They were also set up a few years ago to look at interdisciplinary policy research into the major challenges facing the world and to help teach people about public policy and spread the knowledge and skills. They're interested in place, in progress, in productivity, in decision-making government, and much, much more. They do some amazing things. Do have a look. I'm not going to spend the whole time doing a plug for them, um, but the Bennett is wonderful. There's also a podcast series um, uh, that they run uh, looking at called Crossing Channels, um, and they have some wonderfully star guests. So it's run by Rory Kellen-Jones, famous for all sorts of things, including being an alumnus of this college. And he has also some star speakers on it, including, so far, Diane and Sam, but not yet Alison, I believe. So something to be fixed. Today, though, we, I'd like to turn to our, to our panel. and We're going to talk about the harms that can be caused by technology. What might happen? There are some amazingly good things that can come. But there are also some risks and some threats, whether we look in the domain of, of AI, of various Web3 things, uh, anything to do with big tech. Do we run the risk of generative AI foxing us with, with ideas and images that we have no way to verify? Will we see an invasion of threats being designed by people to tackle our knowledge and understanding of what's true? Will we see AI destroy us all? Uh, Jan Tallinn reckons we have only a few years to go before we reach that, that awful time. Or is the problem actually much more about displacing employment, about exacerbating existing inequalities? What are the harms and how we do we tackle them? That's what we're going to pick up today. And we're going to hear from an absolutely wonderful panel. Now, sadly, Ramsey Brown... Um, 
is almost with us. He's a couple of floors up feeling very, very unwell. Unwell enough that getting him down a couple of floors would be a mistake. Uh, it's a great shame that we won't be joined by Ramsey. He runs the AI Responsibility Lab, uh, which has a product called Mission Control, aimed at making AI safe in this world of chat GPT 3, 4, 5, whatever else is coming. Um, I may try and pitch in a couple of things from him, but I'm, it's a great shame that uh, he can't be with us. Otherwise, we have from the far side, Diane Coyle, who is the Bennett Professor of Public Policy, the University of Cambridge, co-director of the Bennett Institute, director of the Productivity Institute, many, many, many other things. Diane, it's wonderful uh, to have you here with us. Um, the, uh, next is Sam Gilbert. Sam is another of our alumni. He's also an entrepreneur. He splits his time between alum here and doing work with the Bennett Institute, but has also written what to me is one of the most important books in this area called Good Data. We might come back uh, to touch on that, which draws on his experience uh, as employee number one, I think, of a company that really used data to sell personalized insurance in a useful way. I'll let Sam talk about his experience there rather than saying it all. But what can we do for the good with data? Um, Alison Kilburn is a civil servant. She's worked in Bayes. She's worked in the Treasury. She's worked in the Cabinet Office. Uh, she's Director of Analysis in DCMS or whatever it's about to be called, um, is a very experienced uh, economist, uh, leader of analysts, um, and has worked on many multidisciplinary teams. So knows all about analysis, evidence, and economics. So it's wonderful to have the three of you with us. Um, can I hand over now to just have a few minutes from each of you, and then I'll ask a couple of questions, and then we'll have questions from you here uh, or online. Um, can I suggest that while I've annoyed people by standing here, we can all just sit from now on. Um, Sam, over to you. Well, thanks so much, Julian, for that introduction. So to set the scene for the conversation today, I thought I'd just make a couple of remarks about how the technology market landscape is changing and what some of those changes might mean for technology regulation. So as Julian mentioned, I'm an entrepreneur. And from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, we had a decade from around 2009 till around 2019 that was actually relatively stable in that everything in the technology world was really defined by mobile and by social media. So in that time, if you wanted to build a technology business, the kinds of questions that you had to ask were things like, what aspects of human life and of social life have not yet been turned into an app? And then secondly, how can I use social media channels like Facebook and Instagram to promote my app and gain users? Those were great places to start a business from. But what has happened since then is there's been a significant slowdown in the penetration of smartphones uh, and also in social media usage, particularly in the most advanced consumer economies. So what that has meant is that entrepreneurs and also venture capital investors have been asking themselves, what is the next big thing going to be? And I suppose there have been three major candidates to be the next big thing. Um, the first of those is called Web3. So that is an umbrella term for the putative next iteration of the web's core technical payments and legal infrastructure. So it incorporates things like blockchain, uh, cryptocurrencies, decentralized finance, and non-fungible tokens or NFTs. So the second candidate to be the next big thing is the metaverse, popularized by Mark Zuckerberg at the Facebook Connect conference um, a couple of years ago. And effectively what the metaverse involves is the use of virtual reality and augmented reality technology to change the way that we work and socialize and get entertainment. Uh, and then the third thing, and this is really the hottest topic in the technology world right now, is something called generative AI. So what generative AI involves is the application of machine learning algorithms to very large data sets in a way that enables machines to create new text, new images, new music, and so on. So one of the big challenges, I think, when we discuss online harms is that our instinct is to think about the, the previous big thing, so to think about mobile and social media. So just to bring that to life, we might think about children's safety online. 
And I, I think the default position is that when we think about how we can mitigate threats to children's safety online, our minds will go to issues like cyberbullying um, or perhaps the risk that children will be exposed to content that promotes self-harm on apps like Instagram or Pinterest. But what all the talk of the metaverse has really brought into focus is that actually for a lot of young people today, the time that they spend online is not spent in the social media apps that I, as somebody in my 40s, would recognize. Uh, in fact, um, young people are spending massively more time in um, something called massively multiplayer online gaming environments. So this is games like uh, Fortnite or games on the platform Roblox. In fact, I mean, it's really hard to exaggerate uh, the, the scale of these. So I think in the United States, among 8 to 14-year-olds, 85% uh, of people are on Roblox. And what this does is uh, suggest a different profile of threats that young people are going to be faced with. So in the case of um, something like Fortnite and other environments in which virtual goods can be bought and sold, we may find children exposed to the risks of financial harm. Um, on Roblox, a lot of children who've got skills as developers are now effectively working as gig economy um, workers as part of development teams that are coordinated through Roblox. So all of a sudden, children's labor rights becomes an online harm that we need to think about. Um, so just to, to sum all of that up, I think when it comes to public discussion of online safety and online harms and the things that we do to try and mitigate them, the risk is that our mental models of harms correspond to the last big thing. And the opportunity is to design regulation and policy interventions in such a way that they can deal with new forms of harm that by definition can be very difficult to imagine. Thank you very much, Sam. I mean, it's really interesting there that you know, we're fighting the last war. Um, you know, we haven't really talked about the legislation gradually going through Parliament, and we might come back to whether that's the last war, a previous war, or a future war. Um, Alison, can I now hand over to you? Yeah, sure. Um, just checking that everyone can hear me okay before. Brilliant. So I'm Alison Kilburn. As um, Julian introduced, I'm a civil servant. I'm from the, what was the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. There's obviously been machinery of government changes. So I'm currently sat in the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, but also have oversight of all the digital work that has transferred over to the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. For those of you who are not as familiar with government, I am a civil servant. It means I'm politically neutral. I am not a politician. I will not be commenting on um, policies. And what I say is from a technical professional point of view, as an analyst, as an economist, not necessarily of the government's policy of the day. I need to get that disclaimer out there. We always do as civil servants because we are politically neutral. So I am the director of analysis, which means I'm responsible for all the evidence base behind some of the policies that Sam was talking about. It means all the economics, all the official stats. And my role is to make sure that when politicians and ministers are making decisions, they are doing so with the best evidence possible. Now, that might sound blindingly obvious, sat in, a, in the University of Cambridge with the Bennett Institute talking about the importance of evidence. But actually, the thing that you think about with these technologies, with these policies, is just how difficult that is. And it's difficult for a number of reasons, both the very distinct nature of the kind of technologies and policies that we're talking about. They look, they feel very different to the kind of sectors that government traditionally works with and traditionally looks at. The speed of the evolution, you know, if we were sat here five years ago, as Sam has just said, the things that we'd be talking about would be very different from the things that we'd be talking now and the things that we'll be talking about in five years' time. Evidence and data takes time to collect. It is by its nature usually backwards looking. So we are making policy in a world that is evolving and changing and we're doing it in a way that isn't based on um, as much evidence, as much data as we would traditionally do. It's also the issue of definitions. You know, I'm not a gambling person. It's not something that I particularly play in. But if I was a gambling person and I was to go around this room and ask you all for your definition of the things that Sam's just talked about, like metaverse and AI and um, Web3, I'm guessing that you would all give me a very slightly different definition of what that meant. And from an analysis, from an evidence point of view, that's, that's an issue because when you are looking at evidence and when you're looking at data, it helps if you all have the same definition, if you're all looking at slightly the same thing. So when you're looking at international comparisons and looking at things over time, because the definitions change within the same country over time, it means that that is difficult for our evidence base. And it's also these sectors, these technologies are horizontal, what we call in analysis horizontal, which means that they cross the whole economy. They're not vertical, which goes down one sector line, they're much more difficult to measure. 
So in terms of horizontal, we do have definite, we do have measurement. We do measure how big these technologies are for the economy, for society. Um, but it is probably underestimating how big they actually are because we tend to look up in the technical terms, standard industry codes, which means that they are measuring sectors rather than the impact that they have as general purpose technologies across the whole economy. Um, so that's sort of the disclaimer and the difficulty of it. Um, what does that mean? What does that mean for me as a director of analysis who's responsible for the evidence base of this? It means we need to be much more open. We do things like this. We go out and talk to people. We work internationally with our counterparts across different countries. We also talk a lot more to other professions. It is a truly multi-dimensional, multi-profession um, subject. So we work a lot with developers, with um, coders, with lawyers, with financiers to try and get a handle of what's happening because it develops so quickly, we pull in as much information as we can. Within DCMS or legacy DCMS, as we now call it, we have college of experts. We have people who, this is their areas, we draw very heavily on their expertise. And um, we have an R&D program, which is looking, trying to look five years hence to see where the technology is coming, exactly as Sam was saying, you know, where are the limits of this, where, um, where are the areas that we should be thinking about for changes in policy. And we also have as many open conversations pulling in as much information as we can. And I think I'll stop there, Julian. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Lots of things there we might come back to as well about sort of you know, what do we know, what do we think about, what are we trying to do. Dan. Thanks so much. So, I, like Alison, I'm an economist, and I recognise that in some company you need to apologise for that um, these days. But I wrote my first book about digital technology back in 1997. Um, so, a lot of, um, you know, there have been a lot of um, new big things, next big things, as uh, Sam was putting it. So, for example, now the Ofcom figures show that the average Briton is spending 28 hours a week online. So it's changed the way that we behave and consume, the way we consume our leisure. It's changed business models. And I would echo Alison's um, uh, concern about how little we know. So some basics, we don't really know how much companies use cloud computing and what they're paying for it. The, company, the big tech companies don't release much data and it makes it a real problem to analyze um, what's happening. Um, but some of the economic concerns haven't changed since 1997. And that's about um, things like automation. Is this going to, is this new technology, this generative AI, the large language model is going to um, automate a, a whole new swathe of jobs out of existence? What about income inequality? So the underlying question with a, what an economist would call a general purpose technology is um, who's going to benefit from that? And typically, these start out by concentrating their benefits in a narrow area of the economy and on a few people, and then that spreads widely over time. So if you think about steam, electricity, printing, previous big technologies, they have eventually benefited everybody. And one of the concerns about digital tech, including these new kinds of models that Sam was talking about, is that it doesn't look like we're benefiting. And in fact, it looks like there are actually new harms coming along. Um, so the fear about in income inequality is certainly not, uh, not getting any better. And the way that I think about this as an economist is through thinking about market structure and market power and what's the potential for competition. And I was on a panel set up by Philip Hammond when he was chancellor, chaired by Jason Furman. To think, and so this was previous to the metaverse and um, the large language models, to think about how could we make digital markets work better in the sense of allowing new innovations and new competitors into them. And it's actually just really hard to do because the economies of scale are huge. The um, network effects whereby the more users there are, the more everybody benefits from it are very powerful. And the big tech companies have a lot of data about us that they can use and um, other competitors who would come in and use that data in ways that Sam might talk about to deliver useful services and products um, can't access that and can't, can't do that and can't compete effectively. So I guess one of my worries is that this competition problem, the market power problem, and the political power that goes with that is actually going to get harder than ever. Because although we might get lots of competition using these kinds of models, to develop them is actually incredibly costly even more costly than developing the previous versions, the, the previous next big things that we had. 
And so it's likely to be the same group of big tech companies, the same American companies, potentially fu in future some uh, Chinese companies that are competing here. Is that a worry? Well, one of the things I worry about is that it's a monoculture and they're all competing in the same way. Um, another thing that we might come on to discuss and that I probably disagree a bit with Sam about is the advertising driven business model of so many of the free services that we use. If you're funding through advertising, you want to get people to click on things. So the more things go viral, the better it is for you financially. And, and therefore there's very little incentive in financial terms to crack down on things like misinformation or, or conspiracy theories. So one idea that I've been toying with, um, and I'd be interested to know what anybody else thinks about it, is do we need a public service big tech player? If you look back at the origins of the BBC, um, it was introduced as an industrial policy because Britain <coughs> wanted to have a major player in this exciting new tech industry of radio. Uh, and also has been a different kind of competitor. So it's uh, introduced some diversity into the business models and the commercial competitors don't like it. But on the other hand, it means that they're competing on different things than just the, all the same audience and financial incentives. So should there be a, a public service large language model or, or um, uh, an equivalent to CERN, the Large Hadron Collider entity that is jointly run by different governments and research bodies in, in Switzerland? Um, so I was tweeting about this and um, somebody on Twitter said, oh, but the French government has done this. They've got something called Bloom. And there is indeed a French government funded thing called Bloom on, online that I've not got to grips with yet. So perhaps President Macron has just answered my plea, um, uh, but we'll find out. So, but that's my, that's my concern really. It's, it's not just the nature of the technology and what's that going to do. It's what are the incentives faced by the people who are creating and controlling this technology and how do we think as as policymakers about um, uh, governing that that kind of that kind of market that's emerging well thank you very much um some really interesting things there you know how do you have a bbc who appoints the chairman of this new public sector <laughs> thing but that may be a different different topic um I've got a couple of questions I'm going to put to get us going, um, but it's also time for you to think of things that you'd like to ask. If you're online, please use the Q&A feature of Zoom, um, which I have in front of me, and I'll be able to see um, the questions. Can I just start off with that one about business models? Because at this Responsible AI Summit last week, we talked a lot about um, uh, aligning incentives and the need to make sure that you set up a system so that everybody is incentivized to ultimately point in the right way. Um, is that even possible with some of these tech companies? Um, Sam, do you, uh, I'm hoping you might try and justify some of this, then we can see what others think. Sure. So um, D Dan is uh, absolutely correct that I do disagree with her a little bit on the... That's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, uh, on the legitimacy of um, advertising-based business models. So, I mean, just to comment on that, I think from, from my perspective, there's a very valid criticism of... Um, big tech companies and of the situation that we've got into, particularly in relation to social media and entertainment. And that is um, uh, essentially the pursuit of engagement, which some people have described as being the original sin of the internet. So when we have feed environments, whether they're created by recommendation algorithms, whether they're things that we see on our timelines in Twitter, for example, um, Diane is absolutely right that those are optimized to drive likes and clicks and shares and that this certainly seems to have had a very negative consequence for the tone of the discussion that we all have on social media. What I want to do though is separate that from advertising based business models because I, I mean as, as somebody who um, um, cards on the table has spent quite a lot of time working in um, digital advertising, I mean, I, I can assure you that um, spaces where conspiracy theories are promoted and where other unpalatable and harmful com um, content circulates are not places where you want to promote your, uh, your insurance company. And it very much is not in the commercial interests of the big tech companies to allow that type of material to circulate. So, so I, I, I don't think it's um, correct that ads encourage those undesirable consequences. I mean, the other, the other sort of positive things that I would say about advertising, uh, firstly, that the ability to target advertising is actually uh, extremely economically useful. 
And one way that it is useful is that it helps um, exactly the sort of smaller companies that you referred to, Diane, to compete more effectively with larger businesses because through platforms like Facebook advertising or Google advertising, they're able to reach the specific audiences who are in the market for their products. Um, channels like uh, television advertising are only accessible if you have a very large amount of capital available. So, so I think they are, on balance, good for the economy. Um, there's also an argument that I make in my book, which is that when you look at advertising on a global basis, it's almost as if it has a redistributive effect because the value of the clicks that people who live in the UK or in uh, Europe or in North America, um, that effectively subsidizes the provision of free social media and messaging services for people who live in other parts of the world where the value of their clicks is much lower. So it's this sort of underappreciated um, work that advertising-based bus based business models do is allow people who wouldn't have the means to pay for these services to get them all the same. Anyone to give a different perspective? Dan, Alison. So, um Sam and I have had this debate before, as you can, <laughs> as you can probably tell, and um, I, I think these arguments have some force, but I would, I would maintain that having some diversity of model might be a healthy thing to have in, in this market. And the fact that all the big tech companies largely have the same kind of structure, the same kind of incentives is, is, is part of the issue. Could I just add um, one th further thought on that? I understand the model that you're arguing, but I would say the concentration within the market doesn't seem to suggest that it is opening opportunities to the extent that you're suggesting for the smaller companies. They might be on the margins, but when you look at the concentration, that doesn't seem to be what the data is showing. So, so I think you, when you talk about concentration, you're referring to the concentration of power amongst big tech companies like Google and Facebook and Apple and Amazon. Rather, is, is that right? Yeah. So, in theory, I think your, I think your model, I can understand the model, but I'm saying I don't think we have the evidence to back up that that is what is happening at the moment. Sure. So, I mean, just just to um, say something on that um, really quickly. So, I mean, I I, I do. I am very sympathetic to. Um, the, the, the criticisms of the big tech companies as de facto monopoly providers of these services. I just happen to think that a benefit of the business model that they use is that elsewhere in the economy, it enables more competition to have uh, to happen than used to happen in the old world where television and print advertising and direct mail were the, the places that you had to go if you wanted to promote products. Um, we could explore this further. We're in slight risk of sticking to, I think, what you said, Sam, of just talking about the previous things rather than the future, <laughs> which I, I would like to bring us back to. And perhaps a bridging question. Um, and it comes to, to, I think, something that Alison said about openness. Um, can I just explore the role of trust and trustworthiness with all of these areas? Um, we have real problems with trust in the big tech companies, but also with the newer technologies of various Web3 type things, should we trust them? Could we trust them? We've seen a lot of rather questionable behaviour around them. Would, would, would you trust or do you think we should be trusting any of the players in this space, big or small, new or very new technologies? Do you want to, if you... I don't, as a civil servant, think I should be answering about whether <laughs> we trust big companies or not. Um, but I do think that trust is important for people to engage on it. And I think it touches not just on trusting people being able to feel confident in using it, but also some of the points on inequality and the access to markets um, that Diane was talking about. I think trust is fundamental to the way that markets work and trust is fundamental to the way that regulation happens. And I think that's why you see such a big focus, not just on the pro-innovation and the growth aspect of it, but on the harms and the trust that goes with it. But in terms of our particular companies trustworthy, I don't feel as if that's something I should have a view on. Well, it's, it's a bit paradoxical, isn't it? Because people love these services. I mean, there's a growing body of economic evidence about, uh, you know, they're free, you don't have to pay for them, but how much people would value them if they were paying for them. So we all use them and we love them. So in that sense, we are implicitly placing a lot of trust in them. I guess um, what I worry about is that they, the companies get a, a 
total view of us. They can join up so much data about us, and I don't really think they need they need that much data of us. So if we could think about, you know, why Amazon for your marketing purposes do you really need to collect so much more? Is there some um, break that we can put on that collection and, and joining up? I would feel personally more comfortable about it. But then, you know, like everybody else, I use them all the time. And um, so perhaps to um, take us in a slightly different direction, I mean, like I'm in complete agreement that uh, trust is uh, trust is integral in w when it comes to technology. I mean, actually, one of the fascinating things about the development of Web3 as a technology trend is that advocates for blockchain and for crypto and these technologies um, will say that actually, if, if you use this as the basis of the web, it transcends the need for trust. So effectively, the fact that um, data is distributed across a network of different machines gives the whole system a resilience that you could never have if you were relying on a, a, a single um, powerful institution to host it all. I mean, but I've never um, understood that, Sam, because um, that all relies on trusting the thing that goes into the beginning of the system. So it's all very well putting your supply chain on the blockchain so you can track everything, but you've got to know what went in in the first place. So I don't really understand that argument. Yes, so, so I think, I mean, and, and you're, you're touching on a really important problem, which is the garbage in, garbage out problem. If you put bad data onto the blockchain, it, the, the quality of the data is not going to improve. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, so to, to, be, to be clear, I, um, I'm not here to defend hardcore advocates of Web3, but simply to articulate a view that people hold mm -hmm. that through the right technology, you can remove the needs for trusted intermediaries. And uh, you know, I, I suppose the place where like, that is most advanced is in relation to decentralized finance. So the idea that you can have savings products and loan products without a bank in the middle that you, that you need to trust. Um, yeah, so I mean, to, to reiterate, this is this is not a defence, but um, <laughs> it's not looking so good in the finance sector. I was just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and, and I mean, I, I don't want to overlabor that. There have been some issues, and part of the problem is if something's too hard to understand, it's very hard to verify. There've been a number of scams based on Web three because it's almost impossible for somebody to check. Um, how do you how do you learn how to trust those, um, Alison? Can I? You, you, I understand you know caution about saying who, who trust, but. We are talking earlier about what we know people are concerned about. Yeah. You know, and there is evidence, I think, the government has about what people are worried about and to the extent to which the public might trust things as well. Do you want to...? Yes, yeah, so we, we do regular surveys. They're all available online about participation, about people how, in, how people engage, and also the things that concern them. So there is concern about the online safeties, because with the online safety bill, and particularly about vulnerable um, consumers, so that would be children in particular, but... Um, but there's also concerns about the things that make us inherently human. So things like art and culture and work like that and how much automation in particular could replicate that. And what does that mean for the quality of life and the, and the way in which people engage? So you would have seen the work about um, generative AI being used to replicate famous paintings or famous literature and what that means. So it goes beyond just the economic and the, and the sort of that aspect of it but what does it mean for us to be human and what is the limits of what we do which is intrinsically human and what machines can replicate and replicate quickly and replicate well so there's definitely a concern around that as well as the harms that we're talking about in the online safety bill so i'll pretty soon open this up to questions in the room and i hope our students are ready uh, to to take questions or, or online but just very briefly to each of you what worries you most in this area Concentration of power. And just uh, riffing off Alison's um, comments about the evidence, you know, it's part of the dysfunction of modern capitalism, really, isn't it? We've got a food industry that's making people obese and unwell. We've got a finance industry that's costing us all money. And now we've got an AI industry that is doing exactly the things people don't want to do, to do in producing pictures and music. It's not good. Yeah, concentration of power. Sam, what worries you? So I have quite a different worry, and it's actually a worry about something that is implied by a strong concern about um, concentrations of power. So I think if you listen to the rhetoric of some of the founder CEOs in this space, so people like 
that's Sam Altman from OpenAI, um, or uh, Emma Mustak from Stability.ai, you, you will hear a lot of people who will say that um, the right thing to do with the technology is to make it open source, and that we ought to avoid a situation where an organization like OpenAI is essentially in control of um, everything that happens with large language models. And um, the, the big concern that I've got about that, and the reason why that is my um, worst case scenario, is that I think large language models are sufficiently powerful that if they are made open source in a way that people are able to operate them on their own hardware, we will end up with their capabilities out in the world, but without any of the guardrails or the protections that, to their credit, organizations like OpenAI and Google are trying to build in. So uh, yeah, to sum up, I think that like, like open source, that's what I'm most worried about. So everybody forget what I said about Bloom, the French one, because that's all <laughs> <laughs> Alison, what I think worries you? From my perspective, the thing that worries me most is the issue of consent and how much people are aware of what can be done with, with this information. So I think Diane touched on earlier, the ability of the next generation for, you know, for AI in particular to match data, the, the amount of information essentially private companies know about you by where you click, what you do, where you visit, everything is matchable and joined upable. And as we go further and further into um, the abilities, the technical abilities to match this data, it's how much public consent is active and how much of it is not really understood. So I think that for me is the limits of how quickly this industry is developing. And it's not saying that it's all a bad thing. Some of it is definitely for the public good and the ability to join up data and the ability to, to do that is definitely for the public good. But it's how much people understand it because it is a difficult subject. It is a technical subject. Um, and I think that for me is what worries me is how much we are only sort of scratching the surface of what this can do and how little people really understand it. Some really interesting threads here, and we, we haven't really talked about the good, because obviously we've talked about the problems, but you know, the answer probably isn't to disconnect the internet. No. Um, I mean, that would solve some problems, clearly, but I think it may cause some others. Um, do we have any questions that people want to ask? If so, please do just put a hand up, uh, and I'll try and come along. You don't have to be sat over there uh, looking straight at us uh, to ask a question. <laughs> uh, but if we start off, if we, if we might take two questions at once. So if we could take those two. And you don't all have to answer all of them. Uh, well, it's that AI seems to be very concentrated, uh, uh, that the tech big players seem to only get bigger. And what is the effect of this? For example, OpenAI, which just is almost bought by Microsoft. Uh, and it's also different, seems to be different from how social media has changed the world because then it was a disruption. It, be, it came, new players came to the game, and now it seems only the current players become bigger. What's the effect of this? So it's a concentration of power, contestability. If we take the other question in the middle there. <clears throat> yeah, mine's a bit easier. Just um, what do you think the effects, or what are already the effects of uh, Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> so contestability and the wonderful Elon Musk. Who'd like to start? So I'll start on contestability. I, I, I share that worry. I mean, the, the essay question is, um, could somebody to overtake Google in search the way that they overtook Yahoo? Or could somebody overtake Facebook the way they overtook MySpace? And I think the answer is um, not, as, not as things stand. And so um, in the panel I talked about, we um, recommended, first of all, well, a number of things that the Competition and Markets Authority develops some ex more expertise, set up a special unit, that there should be a code of conduct for certain companies, um, and a number of other um, recommendations about data aimed at making the markets contestable so somebody new c could come in. And those are happening, and we don't know if it'll work. And if it doesn't work, the question is, what do you do then? One of the alternatives that Lena Khan, who's head of the FTC in the States, has proposed is breaking them up. But that destroys some of the value for consumers because there are benefits in big companies as well. But that might need to happen. Or regulating them as utilities. And the trouble with that is um, actually the power imbalance. They're 
big, powerful foreign companies who are very effective lobbyists, and it's a, an extremely complex technical area where we don't have the data we need to do the analysis. So that's a bit of a defeatist answer, but I, you know, I think we just have to try and see how far we can get. Anyone else on this, or, or, or on Elon Musk and Twitter? So, so, uh, just to add something to Diane's comments, like I, I share these concerns as well, and um, so just to add a, a, a reason for that. So I, I've been working with a business partner on using these technologies, and I think we've been feeling pretty good about the software that we've been developing. But one of the challenges has been that um, new models come out really frequently, and um, actually the release of GPT-4 last week was a little bit depressing, um, not because of the technical capabilities, but because it became clear that OpenAI had provided early access to a lot of very large businesses who had, in, well in advance of us, been able to develop um, products, I mean, typically to do things like take cost out of customer service operations. But I, I do have this um, concern, like, like exactly as it sounds like you do, that uh, in contrast to the previous generation of technology, this could be a technology that empowers incumbents much more than it enables disruption. Alison? No, I think the issue is around how much it can disrupt and how much you can disrupt the next people. And I think the short answer is we don't actually know, but this market structure and the market concentration suggest that it is different to, to previously. Um, and I think also not just the disruption of the actual technologies, but also how much they are absorbed and adopted across the economy as a whole, because we are also seeing a concentration in who is able to adopt them and who is able to use them. They're not as widespread, both in terms of sectoral split. There are some sectors that have adopted these technologies much more than you expect, so things like finance, the legal systems, and there are other sectors where it's barely touching the capability of what they do. So not just in terms of the power structure of the technology themselves, but also what that does for our wider economy in terms of which sectors and the sectoral mix between the economy on who's able to adopt them. I don't, I've never met Elon Musk. He seems like a terrible human being. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a really interesting example of how difficult contestability is because a lot of you know, well-meaning people thought they'd migrate to Mastodon and I set up my Mastodon account and actually it's just so boring. I never, I never use it and I'm stuck with Twitter. So I think you know, it's a really neat illustration of, um, of the challenge. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to comment on Twitter as well. I'm quite sad about how he's destroying it. Um, you know, I, I've been on Twitter for almost 16 years. Um, and yeah, I know that looks, it existed that long ago, just about. Um, and it's, I mean, it will be a fascinating case study on how to destroy something and to tear it apart. I think the legal consequences that have come with many of the decisions that he's made are, are awful. And it really, really saddens me. Um, he clearly is massively thin-skinned and narcissistic and all the rest of it. Um, but I think it's sad because Twitter... You know, I'm old enough to say it used to be better, um, and I think it was. But I th think while it has had a lot of problems, if you look around the world, it's been essential for communication in lots of places as a really good way of getting information out. And I know lots of people who use it incredibly well, and the way it's failing is really quite sad to see. Um, you know, maybe I'll be wrong. Um, I think Mastodon is interesting, and we, we could perhaps sidetrack onto that. My problem with Mastodon is that I never quite know if I'm using it right. And... I'm not as techy as some in the room, but I'm not completely non-techy. And, and I suspect there's more people like that. Um, should we take a few questions from online? Um, so we've had a number that have come in. Um, can I, I'll, I'll try and do a couple of them again, and again, respond to whichever ones you like. One from Joseph Moiba. Is AI a new colonial tool? If so, who or what is the colonizer, and who are the colonized, uh, as I think it should be? Um, and uh, another one from uh, Nana Seaton. Um, in your opinion, is all concentration of power through technology pursuing the same purposes? Um, monopolizing adverts and social media seems to be somewhat different to alternative currencies, which are a challenging state prerogative in a rather different way. So um, colonial, uh, colonialization and concentrations of power. I'm not sure I understand what that first question means. I, I only know what Joseph said, so. Well, I suppose if there's an empire, it's, uh, it's quote, Silicon Valley. They're not all based in Silicon Valley, but it's that sort of group of people and, and mindset. Um, and it speaks to these issues that we've been discussing about concentrations of power and the way that economic power morphs into, into political power. So I guess that's what the question and, means. And, and, and is it even an appropriate analogy to think of 
Silicon Valley, brackets, which includes a few other places, but not that many, taking control and sort of occupying the rest of the world? Or is that, is that really stretching an idea too far? I mean, I, I think there are some, um, th some helpful things about using concepts like colonialization to think about technology. So um, uh, something that was true of the previous generation of technology, so of uh, social media in particular, was that a lot of the worst externalities about all of our use of social media were offshored. So the majority of content moderation, um, including keeping all of our news feeds relatively free of child sexual abuse material and other material that you want to see there, that is done in the Philippines. And it's done by people working um, very low wage um, jobs. Um, and I think there's a legitimate way in which that can be described as a, a colonial practice. I mean, another one might be the fact that um, all of these technologies are dependent in a way that is often forgotten on the material world. So they're dependent on rare earth metals and minerals that typically come from um, uh, places where there are a lot of, um, like there's a lot of conflict, there's a lot of political problems, places like the, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So there is, there is a genuine sense in which um, all digital technology, including AI, does depend upon um, exploitation of poorer parts of the world in the same way that the economy did in colonial times. And the concentration of power question, I mean, you know, as I an economist, you can probably... And I think, it's sort of building on Sam's point, um, rather than necessarily the concentration That's of power, I think, I think it's different from social media because that is a one use of it. When we're talking about AI, it goes across society and how it's used. And I think to, to try and claim it as one thing and to try and measure it as one thing because it is the technologies might be very similar in how it's deployed but the way in which it's impacting on different parts of society the way in which it's being used are very different so i think you know for those of you who saw um, patrick valance put recommendations that was talked about in the budget and the recommendations accepted the idea of what you need to look at what's the impact of it where is the harms being shown and looking at the impact of it rather than AI is itself you know, you know this better than me but it's so huge it's so big it's difficult to have a view on AI in itself in the way that it is on social media because it crosses so many different things and the uses and the outcomes of it. I don't think you can say AI in itself is one thing. It's where is it hitting? What is the impact? How are you measuring that rather than as a concept in itself? Anyone want to pick up this different approaches to power concentrations? I think the approach is making money. It's quite consistent. So they might look different, but and as an economist, I have no problem with people trying to make money um, as long as it can be contested and, and they can fail, which is, takes us back to the point we were discussing a moment ago. Mm. Or even Silicon Valley Bank. Um, there are a number of questions, mostly at the back half of the room. I don't want to say, can I take these two in the front row? Um, and then I'll take another couple. Um, I just get the sense um, of everything moving really fast and beyond borders. And I just wondered if the panel had a comment about the role of an effective global regulator. And, um, and as a small business person, a creative professional, I'm, I'm just shocked at the amount of things that unfold. And then regulators, national regulators, try to pick up the pieces of influencing of elections, mass misinformation. I, I was on Upwork, just trying to recruit a, a professional in Eastern Europe. And it was routine, apparently, for, for people to create fake accounts, very easy to access, where they would, would, would you'd post something and they would pretend to be a hostile person and, and post hostile comments. And then the public would see the feed and immediately respond, whereas ordinarily they wouldn't interact because they're so shocked and offended by what's been said. Um, and then that makes the cost per click so much cheaper. So the whole thing, this hostility is, was all about reducing the cost of advertising. Uh, just, <laughs> thank you. So, so, so international regulation and uh, whether we're paying people to be hostile, and yes. Yeah, I, I, a question for all the panel, um, not just for Alison, about the, the wisdom of the approach taken in the online safety bill of giving Henry VIII powers to a government-appointed regulator. 
About five years ago, some visitors to this forum may recall, I pointed out that Coinbase was breaking the payment services regulations, so why didn't the payment services regulator just close them down? Um, the answer we found out was that a, a couple of dozen Brexity conservative MPs thought that blockchain was the future of the city, and they effectively blocked that. Um, one of those MPs now sits in 10 Downing Street. Um, we now see um, a wish on behalf of some that AI could somehow magically find its way into our phones and be our own personal secret policeman and our own personal censor, which is somewhat adrift from what machine learning systems can do at the moment. Um, the, the language models you could put in your phone would have a false error rate of 5 to 10% and completely swamp the police with um, uh, false alarms. And therefore, the question is this, what should a regulatory framework um, look like if it's to be reasonably proof against powerful lobbyists, right? Because a, a political appointee as regulator is the last thing that's ever going to be proof against powerful lobbyists. We, we left the EU, we left that framework, what could we have that works? Thank you. So, so, so we have a lot there. Um... Uh, so the first question was about international regulation and professional hostility. Um, the online uh, safety bill, as it now is, what would actually work to avoid lobbying by the very powerful? Who'd like to start us off on, on any of these complex questions? Well, they are complicated. Um, so this, the speed and the sense of being in a hall of mirrors and not knowing what to trust, you know, is absolutely true. It's difficult for um, regulators to keep keep pace with law and um, regulation just don't move at the same speed and it's very difficult to know what's going on so if you're a researcher you try very hard to um, you know keep up to date with all the developments um, and that's hard enough without the constraints of having to do it through a formal political process so I, I don't know what the answer is there uh, I think it's a real challenge maybe maybe Sam will maybe Sam will tell us um, mm -hmm. So I talked earlier about the joining up by big tech companies with all the data. I think that's a challenge for government too. And on the one hand, government wants to do more joining up to deliver better public services to people. But I think there are real pitfalls in that. And I think it should be done with great caution. Um, uh, you know, and as you know, I've talked to you about this before, Ross, I, I completely see your point about the risks inherent in that. And the other thing that I've taken away from the discussions is that online harms have offline implications and we should think a lot about offline harms and how effectively we're dealing with those. So children are people in places with people around them and we need not to forget all of the offline circumstances in, trying, in worrying about online harm. Shall I, I pick up the point about uh, a global regulator? So, I mean, th this is a thing that um, if, it could, if it could happen, it would be fantastic. Um, in the same way, I think it was Thomas Nagel wrote in about 2005 about the, the, the need for a world government. Um, and then uh, Thomas Piketty's um, diagnosis for what we do about income inequality involves a, a, a global wealth tax, which for what it's worth, I also think is a pretty good proposal if only it were a bit easier to implement. I mean, I think that there's maybe reason to be a bit more optimistic when it comes to technology regulation in that the organizations like the Oversight Board, which Julian alluded to in the introduction, um, that is, although it's funded by uh, Meta or Facebook as was, it is um, formally independent. And although it, uh, its powers are fairly constrained, it is in a position where it can actually make um, meta do things and I, this is me reading between the lines but I feel like the fact that it is branded as the oversight board is an indication that it is thinking that in future it might do the same job for other uh, big tech companies as it does for Facebook today so um, perhaps that um, perhaps that's the most like our most realistic prospect of getting something that looks like a global regulation of these issues yeah, so on the global regulation point, I completely understand the question of why you're asking it, because it, is, it does go beyond UK borders and it, goes, it is an international. I think there's a difference between global regulations and global regulators. And I think the issue of going global with this is the speed of which you could make decisions and the speed you'd be able to implement. Because from a practical point of view, international arrangements take a long time to set up. We see that on the climate side in particular, they take a long time to get agreements because each 
government has its own um, mandate and its own way of working. So if my concern around a global regulator is the ability for it to act quickly on a market that's changing quickly and to be able to get agreement to doing that. So I understand the question of why you think, because it is a global issue. My concern was the practicalities of implementing a global regulator. Um, a couple of quick thoughts from me, if I can, and we'll take a couple of questions um, over here. Um, one is, protecting from lobbying is really, really hard, because the people with lots of money can pay better people to think through and spend time lobbying. Um, there's always been this asymmetry that small businesses, startups, do not have money to spend on saying this is what we need in order to achieve it. And there's a real question about how we try to capture the voice of not just the public and the public interest, but of small, innovative, new approaches. And I, I don't think that's a, a well-solved thing, and I'm not going to try and solve it right now. The online safety bill, um, I should admit to, to, to some historic involvement, it started off, the white paper started off with a workshop here, um, just upstairs, um, and I've been fascinated by it. I think it is, with the respect, great respect to the, the civil servants who are doing a phenomenal job of trying to achieve this, an impossible thing to do. I think it is impossible to write legislation which says bad stuff is not allowed, but good stuff is fine. And I think that, that still, to me, is the underpinning approach of that bill. When we look in lots of other areas, you know, criminal justice, we don't try to do everything like that. You know, there's no law of you know, bad stuff, not OK, good stuff, fine. And I think that balance is really, really hard. How do you take out all, all things which could harm people while protecting free speech? I, I, it feels like it's completely impossible, despite the massive efforts by many civil servants to try to write what ministers are asking for. Um, I, I, I'm also concerned there was, I think it was a Labour shadow minister who said that Labour would come in and fix it to remove all risk of harm to children. Um, and it is actually very easy to remove all risk of harm to children online. You just remove the internet from existence. But short of that, I think it's basically impossible. Anyway, that's my, my, my uh, concern and rant. Um, we should take the other questions I'd advertise, which would be much more interesting. So there's one there and then one there. Thank you. Um, I had a first uh, question, which was a slight clarification, because I think Professor Coyle mentioned the example of BBC initially when we were talking about um, the, the public ownership of sorts. So I just wanted a clarification on whether you mean public ownership of, of large dominant uh, tech firms or do you mean it to be a public utility model because they are slightly different in that uh, context because um, in Brussels very recently there was an experiment of having a local digital marketplace and therefore there are arguments to say that digital marketplace should be um, you know, run by the government of sorts, and therefore that raises certain questions. Or would it be a public utility regulation like we have the airlines model? Um, and of course, when we talk about public utilities and, and ownership of sorts, then there are issues of innovation and um, um, innovation which essentially come up, and how do we deal with those? Uh, and lastly, why would any of this be preferable to competition law? Because as of now, competition law of antitrust of sorts has not been in any way being able to take up these issues because of data not being a factor, because of um, when you're talking about mergers and acquisitions that not being, uh, you know, transaction value not being caught because digital uh, tech firms are slightly smaller in that size. So therefore on those. Thank you. So, so um, the public ownership model versus, you know, competition law, how does that work? And then a question up here. So I'd like to go back to the data which you said was the source of the power and how that's shared. Um, and if you think about how it happens today, we have this cookie policy, which is very primitive, and everybody spends a lot of time trying to decide which cookie policy they want to select for each individual website. Just think how you're going to try and apply that to generative AI. Um, so should there be, and this is a question for the panel, some form of uh, policy that's set for users um, a priori, and maybe there's different options that people could pre-select, because as you navigate through the internet and through generative AI, a, a user can't possibly go through the complexity of the data that they're sharing at that instantaneous moment. And surely they need some guidance from experts from the government to say, possibly, or some organization to, to frame the way in which their data is shared okay. so it's done in an understandable and controlled manner. Thank you. So data and the ownership model for, the, for our BBC of tech. So I'll, um, I'll take that one because I raised it. Um, so what I really want is a, a different incentive structure. Uh, I think that's more likely to be delivered by the ownership model. 
And we have this great example, which has created a thriving um, creative sector in the UK, has been incredibly innovative, has one of the uh, world leading R&D departments. So I don't see particular problems with it. And it has um, created a, a different set of incentive structures and different form of, of competition. The trouble with relying on competition policy, it's partly that it hasn't been enforced particularly. There have been something like 500 tech acquisitions, and the only one that was called in and prevented was the CMA preventing Facebook's takeover of Giphy this past year. Um, so, so, so it can be enforced better, but it's just inherently difficult in these markets to get um, effective competition. You're talking about... Um, probably winner-take-all markets, so it's you need um, a contestability, new entrants to be able to come in, um, and we don't know if that works. And on on the data question, I think it is, you know, these models rely on data. They rely on on it being joined up, and in some worlds, that's really useful to have that data being joined up. So you saw it for particularly during COVID, the ability to, for governments to come quickly to join up data to see where people were traveling, to see where the infections were moving. It's been useful in other aspects of health, for example, on cancer diagnosis, being able to join up a lot of data very quickly. So I don't think it's as clear cut as everybody should be able to do this thing because it's used for so many different ways. I think there needs to be a inverted commas, grown-up discussion about how data is used, about what it's used for and the limit of extent. But I think the possibilities, and Sam will know more about this than me from a technical perspective, of what data can be used. I think there is a world where individually your incentive is to say, no, I don't want my data to be used, but collectively you actually do want that data to be used. So I think there is things about anonymization, about a code of conduct and how it's used. Um, there is obviously regulation already out there about how data is used, but the amount of data that is out there, the amount of mapping of people's lives that is out there, um, I think a more informed discussion of how that's used. But I think if the incentive was all to say, no, we don't want our data being used, and the benefits that we're talking about of the positives of these models just couldn't happen because they does rely on data. So I'd love to add something on the, the data question. So I completely agree with you about the ineffectiveness of the cookie law as a way of empowering um, individuals to have more control over data. It does occur to me, though, it's quite surprising that if you use chat GPT or other interfaces on large language models, there isn't really anything overt that says, please don't put your personal information into this system, because it seems... Um, at least plausible that in future people will be able to reverse engineer people's personal data out of large language models. And I sort of have the impression that people who use chat GPT heavily are just kind of putting it in, putting data in without thinking about it. Um, I, I guess to, to try and say something constructive about what solutions might be, um, there's been a lot of innovation, like technical, both technical and governance innovation in areas like data trusts. So the concept of a data trust effectively recognizes that you as an individual might not want to decide every time how you want to share data. So maybe you can have trustees who make that decision on your behalf and you simply opt into a trust that has values that are around making data available for medical research perhaps, but not monetizing it by selling it to advertisers. The data trust can do the um, the decision making. Um, another model that um, Alison, set, without knowing, has set me up perfectly to talk about this. I'm a, a non executive director for an organization called the Data for Good Foundation, which is a um, not for profit organization in Denmark that promotes the socially beneficial and responsible use of data. And without saying too much about it, it has a um, blockchain like um, federated solution so that medical researchers or other kinds of researchers are able to run analysis on data without ever accessing data about individuals. So it sort of speaks to both uh, putting data into the public domain for public benefit, but also to preserving individuals' data rights in accordance with GDPR and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, there's been some really interesting work in the medical area on this, understanding patient data and various others. And I should say, Ramsey, who, who as I said at the beginning, isn't here because he's unwell, his company, Mission Control, have a tool which is exactly des designed to be an interface between a tool like ChatGPT4 and your own private data or your company's information to try to help filter that. Um, he would probably do a far less crude pitch, but also know much more about what he's talking about than I do. But, you know, if it's something of interest to you, you do have a look for that, because I think they're doing some quite interesting things from what little I understand. Um, can I, I, I've seen a question up there, but can I just bring in a couple online, uh, and then we'll go to, to some more in the room. Um, 
So one of them is from, from Kevin Doyle, um, who, who mentions TikTok and the unknowability of what it's doing. But more specifically, is this issue likely to result in a splinter net with competing political software domains? Is there an issue that will have a sort of, you know, an American internet, a European internet maybe with GDPR, uh, maybe a Russian, maybe a Chinese? Who knows what, what, what exactly the lines will be? But when we talk about globalism, where would we actually get to? And can also link with a question from Graham Bridges, uh, who quotes Yuval Noah Harari, who said, for every dollar and every minute we invest in improving artificial intelligence, it would be wiser to invest a dollar and a minute in advancing human consciousness. What, what are your reactions uh, to those two? I've lost track of who hasn't started enough yet. I keep volunteering. Um, don't we already have a splint net? Languages, I mean, we are all used to the English, English language internet and it's quite US dominated, but there are already other language internets. Sam, I'm turning to you because you know more about that than I do. Um, well, so yes, yes, I, I agree. I think that the, the practical reality is that um, certainly in terms of individuals' use of the internet is very fragmented into a, a, a Chinese branch and the rest of the world branch. Um, I think that the debate around TikTok is very interesting in that the, the, from a, a sort of geopolitics perspective, there is this asymmetry. So um, people in China are not able to, well, they're, they're blocked from using um, tools like Facebook. So um, Facebook and other big tech companies are not able to gather data about Chinese citizens. Um, on the flip side, obviously, TikTok is now, uh, well, it's, it's probably the only social media app which has got any kind of growth momentum now. And uh, uh, as everybody will know, there are concerns about the relationship between TikTok, which is a private company, but is also has some connections as all Chinese companies do um, to, the, to the government in China. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I guess the, the question really is, will um, regulators in the US push ahead with something which has been discussed, which is banning TikTok, um, that effectively would just remove the anomaly that exists today, which it's the one sort of Chinese technology platform that is widely used outside China. So, that, so I, I think that's, um, yeah, the, the most plausible scenario. Just to very briefly add on that, I mean, I think it's not just that different countries have different internets and the language point that Diane made. It's also that within the same internet, people use it very differently because of this ability to drive that concentration. We are seeing an increase in people seeing very, you know, they don't use the whole of the internet. They use very specified bits and those ideas and those prejudices and biases you have are very easily exacerbated within, even without thinking about splitting the internet into different things, within the same internet. So I think it's not just a case of, do we have different systems? It's the way in which we use it and the ability of information that we get is increasingly concentrated within them. And the Yuval Harari, no, Harari quote. Oh, human I'm sure any of us could think of good ways to spend $100 billion, but the trouble is we don't have the money. It's Microsoft that's got it. So um, I, would, I, can, I can think of some pro other priorities that I would spend money on, but, I, but it's their money, not mine. Well, we just need to get them to listen to you then. <laughs> so if, you're, if, you're, if you're listening, Microsoft, you, you, you know, tips are available. We're beginning to run out of time for this conversation. We, I'm sure we could go on forever, but uh, we, we won't. So there's a question up there. And then there is a question over here. Wonderful. I was hoping we could get some sort of you know, geographic balance. Yes. This is just a sort of note. Sorry, this is just a sort of note that ChatGPT doesn't quite work the way you suggested it does. It doesn't pick up what people type into the prompt and remember it and use it to train the model. Training the model is enormously expensive and take, costs tens of millions, and it was done several years ago. Uh, the worrying thing is that what he does use to train the model is everything. And because it, computers can't understand, uh, can't understand copyright licenses and legalese in general, the, the, uh, the commission and various, uh, various other organizations have basically said that they can ignore um, copyright licenses and just suck in everything. If you put in inf uh, information about specific diseases, you are likely to get people's private medical data out because it got accidentally shared and so on and so forth. To me, that's much more disturbing. But, um, so, 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 you know, what, what is it getting with the private data versus the training beforehand and sucking everything in for copyright? And the final question, other than one from me, over here. Hello. Uh, well, the question is, um, what about the concept of digital identity? 
um, identity, digital identity, and it, is it going to be a solution to the metaverse issue, or is it just going to be a new way to control uh, internet and uh, privacy? Thank you. So, digital identity and copyright online and the way ChatGPT works. So to, I, I can um, say something about the first one. So, so first of all, thank you. That was really um, helpful clarification to sort of draw attention to some of the privacy risks and intellectual property issues actually being to do with the corpus of data that um, the, the models have been trained on in the first place. Um, I think you know we're already seeing some controversies that um, have come out of this. So the Getty Images is bringing a lawsuit against... Um, stability.ai because um, Getty Images claims probably correctly that images which were their intellectual property have been ingested by the stable diffusion model and that therefore their intellectual property rights have been breached. Um, this is clearly going to uh, play out in a whole load of other areas. Um, it, it sounds like you're somebody who is very technically knowledgeable, so I'm now even more concerned about this issue of um, people's personal data having been used to train models without their, uh, without their buy-in, without their consent, and, and particularly if, if it's technically possible that that um, personal data can be reverse engineered out of it again. So appreciate the clarification. And, and what about sort of digital identity? Um, I was reminded the Tony Blair Institute, whatever the problem, the answer is always some form of identity verification. Um, consistently, whether or not you agree with it or not. But it seems a rather dangerous idea to me. The idea that, I mean, it is this, this idea that you've got a synoptic view of a person and all of their, their biometric data, so you identify them as, you know, Diane Coyle for all purposes for all time, it seems a, a little bit troubling. And we have quite fuzzy identities in real life. And to give a trivial example, my husband uses his second name in life, but post 9-11... Um, he has to get it exactly right. And with anti-money laundering, you've got to get your bank account name exactly right, so you can't change. So nicknames, second names, you, you can't use those anymore. So I would rather think about um, identifying people f for specific purposes. So my bank manager needs to know that I've got money in my account but doesn't need to know my health records, that kind of thing. I think that, I think that is exactly right. I think it is... With data, it's about why you're using it and what is it for, and that we're clear on that purpose. So within the public sector, when we use data, we have to be very clear what we're collecting it for, and we can only use it for that purpose. When you're coming into these worlds and the idea of, of moving it across, I think it is the issue that I was talking about, concern. I think it plays out particularly here and about what you're using it for. So I, I would have concerns about that. I, I would love to wade into a conversation about identity, uh, having uh, one of the first things I did after being elected as MP here uh, was to get rid of the identity cards. It was one of the first things that, that the government did in 2010. So, um, you know, I have opinions on much of this. But I, we are running out of time. Um, we're not running out of material, but we are running out of time. So can I just finish with one final question to all three of you? Um, so I asked you earlier what worried you most. Can I ask the flip side? What are you most optimistic about in this area? What's the good thing that's going to come? I go for so I think for me, the you know, sitting with now across Department for Culture and, and Department for Science, the possibilities of what this could do. Um, we have talked a lot about the technologies and what might come. There is always the sort of risk of the sort of Ghana hype that we think these things are going to change the world fundamentally and then they don't quite. But I think particularly in the sphere of health, particularly in the sphere of education, I think there are some huge possibilities of what these technologies can do. So we have deliberately talked about the harms here, but I think actually the opportunities are enormous. It's just to make sure the points that we were talking about before about equity, about how people access it, and about does it increase um, concentrations of rights, I think are important, but there is huge potential with these technologies, and I think they have the potential to do great, you know, a lot of good as well as a lot of harm. Sam? So I'm um, very optimistic about the potential, particularly of generative AI, to drive economic productivity. So I think a lot of the technologies that have defined the previous 20 years haven't really done an awful lot to uh, improve productivity in meaningful ways, as Diane alluded to earlier. Um, I, I really think that um, generative AI um, can do that. So that's my optimistic note to end on. Um. Well, I think we're all going to say the same thing. When there's a new technology, people get very frightened. I have a wonderful cartoon of 
um, from Victorian times of people being electrocuted all over the place because of this scary new electricity. Um, the same happened with nanotechnology. I don't know if some people here remember the grey goo fear about nanobots replicating themselves and covering the planet in grey goo. So we, obviously one has to be concerned about the harms, but these big technologies have driven um, progress over the long term, and if we get the structures right, they can do it again. Well, I'm afraid that really is all we have time for. So thank you very much to the three of you uh, for taking part in this. We could explore these much, much further. But firstly, Alison, Sam, Diane, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.